I can see your screen. Ah. Uh, huh? Sorry? Yeah, hang on. I if the time is... We should start. That's what you're saying. Yeah, right? yeah. Not that easy. Give me a minute. <laughs> Should we give them right now or? So we're preparing to start. I hope we're trying to find the meeting material first, but hope it will work. Uh, so time to come in, close the door, sit down. Please close the door also. So now we have three shares, one AD, but no secretary. Anyone that seen Mac? Seen Mac? Ah, he's there. Okay. <laughs> I thought he was going to be here. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the MPLS working group session. Um, so Loa usually does this uh, opening, but he had asked uh, that I uh, give a hand and help this time. Uh, and here I am. So, uh, <clears throat> this is the MPLS working group session at IETF 106. I'm Tarek. I have Nick and Loa next to me. Um, as working group chairs. Uh, we have Mac as our working group secretary. Um, next slide. Uh, th by the way, this is the only uh, session uh, that we're meeting uh, this time uh, at IETF for MPLS. Um, this is the note 12. Uh, it states the rules uh, for participation and contributions to IETF. If you're not uh, acquainted with it, please take the time and go through it and uh, get familiar with it. Um, everything that you say uh, in, in this meeting and other IETF meetings is on record and may become public. Uh, you don't have to say much, but... <coughs> um, uh, next, yeah. So we, we are using Etherpad for uh, taking no, uh, minutes. Um, I... Uh, I ask everybody 
to uh, to jump in and help in uh, in captioning any discussions during the presentations. Um, we are also streaming and recording. Um, please c clearly state your name when you're uh, at the mic. This will help remote participants know um, uh, the person at the mic as well as the uh, minute takers. Next slide. So we have our agenda posted. Uh, there hasn't been many changes since it was originally posted. Uh, we have a full agenda. It's pretty tight. We ask all the presenters to stick to their time slot. And the chairs will be monitoring the uh, questions at the mic and cut as needed. Uh, we, we do encourage um, longer discussions to happen on the mailing list. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, still the agenda. <clears throat> so blue sheets, we have two blue sheets. Uh, please uh, uh, sign your name and pass it on and uh, return it back when you're done. Thanks, next one. Uh, we don't have any errata uh, this time since last meeting. Um, it's a good thing. <laughs> we have one liaison that came to MPLS. It's actually to multiple working groups uh, from the optical transport uh, networks and technologies. Um, we have uh, Scott Mansfield is, uh, is working on compiling an answer and getting the uh, inputs from the respective working, group, working groups. Uh, moving on to our uh, documents, uh, we don't have new RFCs this time, but we have several documents that, that are in the editor's queue. Um, we were hoping that one will be already RFC this time by, by this meeting. I'm not sure it happened. But uh, we have several documents that are, uh, as I mentioned, in the editor's queue as well as in the ISG uh, for publication. Um, uh, the first one in IESG, the Yang model for LDP, I, uh, we have it on the agenda. We'll give it a quick update uh, today. Uh, the LSP ping registries is also on the agenda, and Loa will be talking about it next. So as I mentioned, uh, we will be giving an, an, a quick update on all the Yang modeling in MPLS working group. So the three documents there are on the agenda. <clears throat> Uh, continuing on with the individual uh, documents, uh, we have the 00, zero version. Uh, most of them are on the agenda. They will be presented today. Um, again, we have other, th other drafts, non-00, zero zero, which are on agenda. We have the SFL control uh, draft. We had uh, spoken to um, Stewart last time, and um, he indicated that uh, he's gathering some input from the authors or co-authors. We would, you know, if if you can come up to the mic and give us a quick update, uh, that's also a, a good thing, Stewart. I'm waiting for some input from one of my co-authors. They are not very easy to get hold of at the moment. Okay. <laughs> I guess then we're waiting for more input from you when... when you get in touch with the person? Soon as I get hold of them, or when I decide it's timed out, I will pass it to the working group to take the next steps. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of other drafts also on the agenda. Um, I do, OK, maybe in the, in the updates, I will be talking about it. Uh, so these are the documents that uh, um, are already working group uh, ad adopted, and we're giving uh, you an update on them. Uh, the first one, uh, we have this MPLS BFD directed uh, document. The current status is stalled. Um, we have received feedback from the RTG directory, and uh, there are comments raised uh, specifically from Carlos. Uh, if the authors or, the, or Carlos is here, we encourage them to uh, um, come up and, and share their inputs. We know that there are further discussions that go, are going to happen face-to-face -face as well as on the mailing list to try to come up uh, with the um, a conclusion uh, on, on this draft, how we want to progress it. Um, I don't see any authors or Carlos. 
Okay. So the second draft uh, or working group document, uh, the status, it's the RMR MPLS based draft. Uh, it, it was submitted to IESG for publication. We are currently waiting for uh, AD write up and there's no, uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not blocked basically. Uh, the third draft, uh, we have LDP RMR extensions. Uh, it, this one is waiting on the base RMR uh, to be published. And one, once that happens, we will move ahead with requesting publication of this one. Right. Terry, it, it's Deborah. Uh, hi, Deborah. So if you go back, the RMR one, I had, we finished last call, and they have to respond to the directorate reviews. There was a bunch of comments before we can schedule for telechat. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll double check that. Okay, and I see Kriti is there. I. Thought you they responded, but yes. So I think it was a security director that had comments. They said you don't have to make a, a change to this, and anyway we we're locked up. So as soon as well, I, I guess at this point we can make the changes. I don't remember anything that was difficult or, um, you know. Uh, so I I think we're we're good. Well, okay. So we'll have that in the next week or so. Okay. Then Deborah can do her thing. Okay, thank you then for the update. Um, okay, so moving on, we have MPLS, M MLDP MIB uh, document. This one has uh, gone a review from the MIB doctor and uh, the comments were addressed, uh, but we're waiting for the go ahead from the, the MIB doctor. We don't have, my understanding is, is we're trying to get a hold of a uh, MIB doctor uh, there is a uh, replacement uh, um, in, in the works, but uh, so this one. Once we have the go ahead from the MIB doctors that all the comments have been addressed, we will go ahead uh, and close the working group last call. Uh, the next document we have is MPLS uh, SPL terminology. Uh, the, the, the status of this one is it's stable, ready for working group last call after a minor editorial update of the abstract specifically. And uh, the next steps, we will be going ahead with the working group last call after this update. Uh, the last draft, uh, it, is, uh, it is submitted for IESG for publication. <clears throat> we uploaded a, a recent revision that addresses all the comments we got and um, we're waiting on the next steps. Next one, please. And um, the LSP ping registries update, uh, it is on the agenda. So we will be talking more about it today. Um, the MPLS SFL framework, uh, this is the one that I wanted to flag that we triggered a working group uh, last call. Actually, we triggered a, um, a poll, IPR poll, um, in preparation for a working group last call. Uh, we did receive, uh, two acknowledgements from two authors, but uh, the rest of the authors, we haven't received any response from them. So we do encourage the authors to, at least the ones that are present, uh, to try to get a hold of the other ones and so that uh, you know we can move ahead with the uh, last call. Could you privately, and I mean privately, remind the authors who have responded uh, who they need to go and... Yeah, I, I did. I did Set, resend and mention who responded and not. It's already on the list, but I'll do that privately, sure. Thank you. We'll no problem. Do some rounding up. Sure. And uh, the last one, um, it's still the, related to the uh, part of the SFL family uh, drafts. Uh, um, it's ready for working group last call, but we want to proceed only after the base SFL document uh, gets published. So the next steps would be uh, to go ahead with the working group last call after we publish the base uh, framework for SFL. And that's it. Um, I did promise Nick will cover, but <laughs> somehow I kept going. Uh, so who's next on uh, the agenda then?
think it's uh, Juan. Juan is up with the path segment in SR MPLS or MPLS interworking. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chuan Xiong from ZT. My presentation today is path segment used in SR and MPLS interworking. Um, this draft has been presented last meeting, and uh, we got some feedbacks and comments. So uh, thank you very much. So this time we updated the drafts and uh, uh, made some clarification. So let's. Thank you. Uh, so let's do some uh, quick a recap of the path segment. Uh, path segment is defined in the ITF Spring MPL's path segment draft. It has ha it has been proposed and adopted in a Spring Working Group. And the path segment is uh, is an identifier for uh, SR paths. Uh, it can be used to achieve three uh, function like the uh, the uh, uh, performance measurement, bidirectional path correlation, and end-to-end uh, -end path pro uh, protection. Um, and in this document, uh, the path segment uh, will be extended to uh, be used to provide end-to-end -end, uh, bidirectional service in SR and MPLS interworking scenario. For example, the past segment may be used to uh, to do the path correlation, not only in the bidirectional path correlation, but also the inter-domain path correlation. Uh, and uh, the path segment may be defined to identify an MPLSTE turner and uh, the MPLSTE label list. So uh, as the figure show, uh, the SR MPLS interworking with the uh, path segment, uh, for example, we have three domains from access network, aggregation network, and call networks, respectively. And uh, the three domains may be all, uh, may be all the MPLS networks before, and uh, then when we use the, when we apply the SR architecture uh, to the networks, uh, we may be used, um, we may be up, we may upgrade the uh, SR uh, technology to uh, uh, deploy the SR technology to the access network and the call network. And then we must consider the scenario over SR and MPLS interlocking. And uh, uh, the path segment, as we all know, the path segment may be used at uh, the head end to uh, correlate the bidirectional uh, passes and uh, to achieve the uh, bidirectional path. So uh, we need to consider the uh, bidirectional end-to-end -end, uh, service uh, from the access network to uh, call networks, for example, from the load one to load nine. So the path segment one, two, three, and um, it uh, are the identifiers uh, to, uh, of the three domains. And at the head end, the path segment uh, can be used to uh, to do the bidirectional correlation as the as before as the uh, pa, uh, ITF MPLS path segment the draft uh, described. Um, and in this document, uh, we define the path segment uh, to do to do the. Uh, uh, Inter-domain correlation. First, we uh, define the path segment to be an identifier of uh, of the MPLS TE turner, and then the path segment one and the path segment two can be correlated uh, to do the inter interdomain uh, stitching. And uh, the um, the procedure is the same with the bidirectional correlation. So. The path segment can uh, can be used to do uh, to achieve the end-to-end -end bidirectional uh, VPN. So uh, we got comments from last meeting. Uh, so we made clarification first. Uh, in SR and MPLS interworking, there are two models: nesting model and the stitching model. Uh, in the nesting uh, nesting nesting model, the 
bonding stage and the past segment can be combined to achieve the in inter domain stitching and the past uh past monitoring uh, the bonding stage uh, is uh, can be used to do the inter domain stitching and as uh, past segment to do the past monitoring and in the but in the stitching model the stitching of uh, past segments uh, could be used to achieve both the inter domain stitching and the past monitoring um, the, because the SR and the MPLS domains may be deployed in incrementally and independently, and the stitching model may be appropriate for this scenario. And the uh, comparison with the bounding seed, as we know, the bounding seed could be bound to a uh, seed list or selected paths, uh, for example, the MPLS TE Turler. And they're used to stitch the surface across multi multiple domains. But all of the uh, bounding seed mu must be provided and pushed onto the label stack at the head, head end. Uh, and all of them, all of them are popped at an, a lot of them are popped at uh, the engine node. For example, uh, in, uh, in the, in transit domain, uh, they just uh, pull, pull, push pull out the bounding seed, uh, uh, which bound to uh, the uh, domain, uh, the current domain, but not pop out the bounding seed uh, of the last domain. So they, uh, the domain must maintain the bounding seed of the last domain. So we consider this uh, procedure is not independently. So, uh, we, uh, propose the, mm, the, uh, pa uh, the stitching of past segments to do the end to end, uh, the, uh, surface, bi directional uh, surface and the, the, mm, the past segment can be used to achieve the end domain stitching and the past monitoring. So we need more uh, feedbacks and uh, to do the further updates. So uh, comments and the discussions are very welcome. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> the next one we have is Rakesh. Are you asking a question or? I'm just asking one question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the past segment draft, uh, which is the spring uh, working group document, um, and I think the comment was also given, uh, it describes the past segment of binding seed base uh, stitching. So um, what is new here compared to that? Like how is this different? I know it, it's still stitching because I know you call it nesting, but it's, um, this allows us to you know, go from one end to other end, and it's shown in figure three in that document. So I'm not sure what's new here and um, what is it that uh, this draft we're trying to do? Is it like an information or are you trying to define the standard or, or not clear to me? Yeah, my uh, draft the uh, creation is that we uh, define the past segment to uh, identify an MPL a TE Turler. Uh, second, we use the past segment to do the interdomate stitching, not the bounding seat. We think the bounding seat is not appropriate for the stitching model. So I'm next in key. So uh, I have a follow-up question to Rakesh. Uh, well, I actually, I think it would be a good idea if you took the author group from both of these documents sometime during this week, sat down and tried to sort out how many documents do we actually need? Can we merge in one? Should we do two? And what should go in each document? and did that offline and reported back to the mailing list. Okay. And I think that Rakesh has the, uh, you are the stucky here, you need to make it happen. Okay, yeah, thanks. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, the solution, uh, there is uh, another different point uh, from uh, the Binding is that it can support a bidirection um, stitching solution, and uh, I think it it's a uh, very useful for uh, some operator who have a uh, deployed the uh, past segment. With that way, it can 
uh, can be convenient for them to get end-to-end -end monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk more during the week, but the binding seed itself would uh, contain the, the, the label stack as well as the path segment, right? So the stitching really happens between path segment and binding seed, not the path segment here and path segment there kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Dhruv, uh, I, we, uh, I've tried to discuss uh, with Kwan already, but we are not able to come to an agreement on the fact that uh, when we define path segment and it has a particular use for identification only, can we start using the same path segment now stitching? That's the crux of the argument. They, uh, their thing is we already have the path segment. We want to add more functionality to, to it. And on the other hand, we said that's not how it was envisioned. It had a particular meaning. And if you are changing the meaning of the path segment, let's go through the process and discuss it a little bit more. I think that's where we are right now. Thank you. Yes, we uh, use the path segment to do the stitching, but the stitching not uh, the, the same meaning with the, uh, the, the stitching before. We use the path correlation to do the stitch, to do the stitch, like the bidirectional correlation. Uh, so I think the procedure is the same with the bidirectional. Uh, we also uh, both do the correlation. Uh, the difference basically is that in case of bidirectional, there's no forwarding thing happening here. When I re receive this path segment on one interdomain, so again, I need to forward it on onto the next segment. So it's leading into the same action that a binding segment already does. When I receive the binding segment, my job is to decide what I need to do next. And we are uh, saying that I want to use the path segment to do what binding segment already does. That's where the confusion is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Rakesh. So in terms of uh, bidirectional path, this draft doesn't add anything new than what's already there in the path segment um, draft. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we will do the discussion of nine uh, for further discussion. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rakesh Gandhi, and uh, presenting the um, PM for uh, SR and PLS draft on uh, behalf of the authors and contributors. So uh, this look, this is a zero zero draft, but um, this was just transferred from the Spring Working Group to the MPLS Working Group. So the agenda: we we'll look at the requirements and scope, the history of the draft. Uh, the updates that's made since uh, last uh, this was presented in spring, some summary and the next steps. So this is for the uh, delay and loss measurements for uh, SR links and end-to-end -end policies, uh, advertising the metrics in the network, uh, various measurement modes, one way, two way, and loopback. Uh, the scope is uh, SR with MPLS data plane. Uh, using RFC 6374 as well as 7876 for the UDP return path for the response. So a uh, draft is about a year and a half old. Uh, it was a spring um, uh, draft. Uh, it was, uh, it has been uh, presented in spring uh, as well as IPPM working group and um, recently uh, uh, moved to MPLS with a new name as mentioned. So uh, since it was presented last time, we have added uh, uh, return part TLV, uh, block number TLV. Uh, it's a standard track uh, because there is a INI accents. accents. Uh, Lookback mode is defined and added some uh, details on P2MP SR policy as well as ECMP and some various uh, editorial changes. So just a uh, summary, uh, since this is being presented first time in this working group, um, so using the, the 6374 uh, 
mechanisms, uh, gal gas, as well as the message formats, um, the delay and loss is measured for SR links. Uh, the measured metrics are advertised uh, in the network. Uh, there are RFCs uh, 7471 or 7810 or 8571. Uh, for SR policy, uh, the probes are sent using the label stack. Uh, the path segment ID we were just discussing is is just about the gal. Uh, the one-way measurement mode uh, where the reply is sent out of band using the existing 7876 mechanisms. Uh, for two-way measurement mode, uh, this draft defines a return path TLV. Uh, for loopback measurement mode, the return path uh, label stack is added in the header of the packet. So the new uh, return part TLV for two-way measurement uh, defines a few uh, types. So uh, we had received feedback to align the, the, the TLV with the BFD uh, kind of structure. So we have done that. So there is one, one return part TLV, and it contains the sub-TLVs. Um, and it defines uh, either uh, SRMPLS label stack or binding seed or in case of a bundle, you want to send the reply back on the same uh, incoming interface. Uh, for loss measurement, uh, uh, it defines a block number TLV. So although we use the um, synonymous uh, flow label for coloring the traffic, uh, when we send the probes, uh, we use this TLV to identify uh, the counter is for which uh, block number. Uh, replication seed uh, uh, is used, uh, can be used for P2MP SR policy. So we welcome your uh, comments and suggestions. Um, the RFC 6374 uh, has been implemented and deployed in many networks. It's been around for a while. Uh, we do believe that this uh, draft is ready for working group adoption in MPLS working group. Uh, the INA code points uh, allocated by MPLS working group. Um, we've been asked to keep Spring Working Group in the loop for SR aspects. So uh, we'll update uh, the Spring mailing list uh, when we update the drafts. Uh, and about the milestones, uh, this is the message from Bruno that please keep Spring in the loop for their Spring specific content. So that's all I had for this one. Greg? Yes, uh, Greg Mirsky, ZT. Uh, can you roll back uh, to. Um, um, Return path TLV. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, um, how this uh, proposed uh, return path uh, TLV is different from uh, non FAC uh, TLV proposed in uh, uh, BFD for Spring? Because it uh, proposes to use a segment list uh, explicitly for return path uh, for the BFD session. Yeah, so these are the probe messages, um, uh, uh, crafted probe messages uh, injected by querier, and this TLV is added in the payload. And mm -hmm. when responder sees this, it has a choice. So without this TLV, it would send the reply out of band IP UDP path using yeah, RFC right. 7876. No, Otherwise, it would send using this. Yeah, thing. I understand mechanics. I'm asking how this is different from what's proposed in. Uh, BFD draft for Spring. Yeah, so there are many return path TLVs proposed uh, for LSP ping or the um, BFD. The, um, so the intent is the same. The reason why it's in this draft is because we need the INA code points for uh, the 6374 uh, TL, uh, TLV, right? Mm, but it's already being proposed, so why why not reference it and just use one uh, construct for so, BFD and for performance measurement? So it's the same construct, and I think you gave a feedback, and uh, the structure of this TLV is the same as the BFD. Uh, uh, thanks for your feedback. The reason why it's here is that we need to get uh, all of these code points listed in the 6374 uh, types. He needs, he needs a, a 6374 allocation from, uh, from one of its registries. Oh. There's a registry you can't have a private discussion. Okay. Okay. 
I was just reinforcing what uh, was said from the front, that the, the only way to get a registry in entry in the IONA uh, code, code points is to specify that you need it. So uh, they've chosen to do that rather than virus an indirect route some other how. But they do need to say, please, can we have an allocation for this TLV uh, identifier? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, can, we go, yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? So um, you said that uh, this block number TLV is for alternate marking method with the uh, synonymous uh, flow labels. Yeah. I mean, the coloring of the traffic can be done by an, any means which is beyond the scope of this draft. Mm -hmm. The draft is for the probe messages, and it carries counters, and it needs to identify the context of the counter to say, which block number it belongs to. So that's what this TLV is for. Uh, okay, so so this is not for alternate marking method? So alternate marking method basically says you need to color the traffic, right? So, so the coloring of traffic is done either with synonymous labels uh, or some other mechanisms uh, outside the scope of this draft, but all draft is defining the probe messages for uh, counters for the loss loss measurement, so you need to say the co context. So say this counter is for this color or this block number. So you but, can correlate. But okay, uh, it's confusing. So, wait, Greg, wait. Yeah. I think uh, yours and Rakesh discussion now is nearing the point where you actually need to take it to the mailing list. Okay. So you need to do that. Okay. Uh, we cut. Stuart, are you in line? Okay. So we cut the line off, Tarek. Uh, Sam Aldrin, a um, couple of quick questions. Um, in this case, are you proposing the, I haven't read the draft completely, so I don't know exactly what the content is, uh, but the curious to know, are you proposing some extension to existing mechanism like LS Pipping or something? Because I want to know, for example, everything is working, it's fine, but if the, the LSP breakage or whatever, right? How do you know you're actually getting response from the right node? How do I know the response from the right node? So the um, RFC 6374 does have a, a source address uh, TLV, and Stuart is uh, nodding his head. So that basically tells you who is who is sending you the message, so you can check. I mean, like for example, let's take you have LSP breakage and it pops a packet, right? So are you discovering that okay, this packet is not destined for this, so I'm not going to process and respond. But if it is punted, right, you lose the context of where the packet has come from and who the destination is. And in that case, you respond back. And so you don't know exactly who, uh, so, who is responding from the source. Yeah. So let's say if you have node A, B, C, uh, A is, is supposed to be punted at C, but it's punted on B. B will reply back to A. Right. It will put the source address as B. So A, A comes to A, looks at the session ID and says, <laughs> Why is B replying and not C? So something is wrong. So you're purely basing on the source address of the response. Yeah, so it's already in, in the RFC 6074. Uh, TLV is defined for this purpose. I see. OK. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Tark, um, I have a question, Rakesh. I asked it on the list about the uh, delay measurement for end-to-end. -end. Uh, specifically when you have ECNP. Um, yeah. So you end up, your probes or whatever way you're testing the delay, you, they end up hash, ha, being hashed on any of the ECNP paths. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily exercise all the paths, but your response was you, you need entropy label. Um, and I want to make sure that you're uh, stating that entropy label is a must in this case. You cannot do hashing on any other um, um, field. You have to have entry label for your delay measurements to work. If that's the case, why don't you mention it in the draft? So, um, so it is there in the draft. Uh, there is a section. Uh, I forgot to include this in the slide, but uh, the entropy label uh, is there in the draft for ECMP handling. Uh, this is MPLS, so there is no uh, IP header here. So hashing, hash, hashing either is done using label stack or entropy label. Yeah. So there is no, nothing else that you can use for hashing. Is not, uh, 
uh, an option like hashing on any other field. So, so, so 6374, as I remember, talks quite a lot about uh, this issue of... Still, I'd get on... closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. I think 6374 talks about this quite a lot, as I remember. Um, certainly, synonymous labels talks about this quite a lot. So, I think the um, the normative references will give you a pretty strong hint. Although there's no harm in reinforcing it with a sentence or two here. Yeah, it is there in the draft. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we Thanks, need to sir. do on next presentation, please. So, a uh, uh, second draft uh, for SRMPLS. Uh, this is the IOM draft. Uh, so presenting the draft on behalf of uh, the authors and contributors, uh, many thanks to them. Uh, the agenda requirements and scope, the history of the draft, updates uh, made since uh, last ITF. Uh, this was presented in uh, Montreal. Uh, some summary and the next steps. So this is uh, to transform, transport the IOM data fields uh, with SRMPLS and CAP. So the I, IPPM working group uh, has done quite a bit of work uh, for IOM, um, defining uh, various data fields. Um, there are many drafts, uh, are some of them listed here, but uh, there will be uh, uh, you know, more drafts and more uh, progression uh, of the technology. But here, all we're doing is defining the NCAP and DCAP procedure for SRMPLS. Uh, we cover the H2S as well as uh, hop by hop. So the history of the draft is about a year old. Um, it was originally discussed in IPPM working group, then um, was asked to take it to the spring working group. Uh, so it, this was presented in the spring, uh, as well as in MPLS working groups. And uh, uh, we have a home now. So this, this draft will be uh, uh, progressed uh, in this working group. So since uh, Montreal, um, we have addressed uh, several comments. Um, so one comment uh, was about the uh, incorrect IP header based hashing. So we have uh, added uh, flow label based mechanisms. Uh, there is an example added uh, with path segment ID, uh, various uh, editorial uh, changes as well. Uh, we do have an open item to add the procedure for hop by hop IOM. So just to recap, um, there is an indicator label um, added uh, on the MPLS header. And just below this uh, is the IOM data field. So uh, IPPM working group has uh, extensive uh, procedures for IOM. So uh, this draft doesn't uh, really talk about uh, uh, how to process the IOM uh, various trace points. Um, and in order to uh, not break the IP header based hashing. Uh, there is a, a, a second format defined uh, using a different indicator label. And right after that, uh, the first four uh, nibbles are zero so that uh, IPv4, IPv6 uh, hashing is not broken. Uh, and we took advantage of the space to put the flow uh, label that as well. Uh, so basic procedure is that the NCAP node inserts the uh, indicator label and the IOM data fields, and the DCAP node uh, pops it and uh, uh, takes uh, uh, takes a local timestamp and uh, uh, gives the, the the IOM data to uh, for further processing. So uh, indicator label allocation methods. Um, that there is there are two. Uh, uh, TBA1 and TBA2 uh, labels can be uh, allocated from the extended special purpose labels. Uh, it can be allocated by a controller as well, or can be uh, allocated by uh, signaling uh, by the DCAP node. Uh, similarly, for hop by hop, it's a di different uh, uh, indicator label is used to indicate the transit nodes. So this is hop by hop. Although I do agree that uh, it's difficult to uh, implement with current hardware. And uh, similarly, one for the to not break the IP hashing. So next steps, uh, we, we, we have some more work to do uh, for hop by hop or P2MP and, and whatnot. Uh, but meantime, we welcome your uh, comments and suggestions. Uh, we would, uh, so MPLS working group is the home for this draft now. Uh, we'll keep uh, spring working group in the loop for the SR aspects. 
uh, and uh, the, often this comes up in IPPM working group as well. So we will keep uh, that working group uh, in the loop as well. Uh, that's all I had. Adrian? Hello, I'm Adrian. Um, if I read this right, you're asking for four new labels. And that worries me. We've only got eight currently free. Um, we, we have, yeah. So uh, an option here, are these extended? Yeah, it's extended, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I will change my question. Could you consider redrawing the pictures to show that these are extended special purpose labels? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. So thank you, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, I think uh, this um, uh, draft uh, we have uh, presented uh, it uh, um, two times. And uh, uh, before this meeting, we have already received some comments. And uh, uh, we also uh, uh, accept those uh, comments and we'll update uh, the draft uh, uh, next uh, next time and uh, uh, I still hope to present uh, the draft uh, here and then we will give some uh, our next step plan uh, uh, why we want to present uh, this uh, draft because uh, we have deployed uh, in our network it works really fine it can give you some uh, experience uh, share uh, so uh, the requirement uh, it's uh, uh, for the large network, uh, especially when we deploy the SR based uh, functions, it's really important for us to monitor the end to end network performance. Um, uh, at uh, this morning, I set up, uh, I give an example such as uh, uh, one big city, Beijing, we need to deploy even more than 30 key nodes. And it's really hard for us to manage that. Uh, so we need the accurate in-band OEM to help us to manage the whole network. So the requirement here is that we want the OEM is in-band. And we want it can monitor the hop by hop performance and end-to-end -end performance. We hope it can use the unified solution to do the both VPN monitoring and tunnel monitoring. And um, we also want the uh, SDN controller uh, can uh, support such as a telemetry, uh, something like that uh, to improve the uh, efficiency. And uh, the intention of the draft, uh, we defined uh, the encapsulation for MPI's uh, performance measurement with uh, alternate marking method. And uh, the alternate marking method require one color bit of the data packet to measure the packet loss of the data traf uh, the traffic flow and uh, require one more timestamp bit of a data packet to measure the delay and jitter. Uh, and uh, the basic encapsulation uh, like this uh, uh, figure, uh, I, I know there are a lot of uh, big concern here, such as uh, we touched the liber here, we redefined the TC bit. Uh, uh, but uh, here I want to see that uh, based on our experience, this solution is really easy to 
be implemented in the existing network because uh, it's a uh, uh, if you can support uh, multiple layer labor and you can support uh, this definition because uh, the tc bits can easily be redefined within this uh, environment uh, but of course maybe standard uh, uh, from the standard uh, point of view uh, it break some uh, rules but uh, it's very easy to implement and uh, it's very effective to monitor the performance it's a uh, high efficiency and uh, uh, here is our deployment scenario and the left one is uh, our end-to-end -end, uh, the, the, the stitched SR tunnel uh, we may have a different domains within one work uh, one network and uh, we can use this solution to stitch the SR tunnels and the second one uh, it, the, the, it can provide uh, the end-to-end -end VPN service performance monitoring and uh, uh, this is uh, the basic use case in our network and uh, uh, in Beijing and Shanghai, this big city, we have deployed uh, the SR-based uh, network uh, to carry 5G base station. And uh, uh, we use this solution to monitor the end-to-end -end performance. It provides a really good result. And uh, our maintenance team give a really good feedback. And it's very easy to implement it. Our vendors also give a really good feedback because it uh, for them the workload is very low, but uh, the uh, performance is really good. And uh, next step, uh, we received some uh, concerns. The first one is uh, the special purpose labor uh, is uh, unable to assign. So maybe the solution is that we will uh, hope to get some uh, some something like uh, the uh, the last presentation. We use the uh, extended spatial purpose labor, and uh, the second concern is that uh, the traffic class and the TTL of MPR's labor can't be changed. We will not touch it uh, in next. Uh, version and uh, the third one we got some uh, comments from uh, email it uh, seems um, uh, SFL solution uh, can be used uh, to uh, resolve the MPRS performance requirements but here we compare that we found that the current version of uh, SFL draft cannot meet our requirement including hop by hop performance and uh, the performance on RSP and VPN in parallel. So we will update our draft to follow the standard, but uh, we will keep the solution in our network. It's uh, not so good, but uh, uh, the world maybe works like that. That's all, thank you. So Stuart. I have a few comments, some of which you sort of address, um, but I'm going to touch on, I'll touch on them anyway. So first, um, as I understand it, if you, in order to do your um, in-network or, or uh, along the LSP um, instrumentation, you're expecting the packet parser to look at uh, two, pack, two labels in the packet, the top label and another one. This is a, a topic that we discussed extensively during the time when we were looking at the TMPLS OAM design and the opinion of this working group was that that did not conform to the MPLS architecture and was not something that we could support being deployed. It has particular difficulties in building parsers because you've got to get your address recognition engine to go and look up two uh, labels. We, we have rejected that solution in the past. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, so that would be a major, yeah. major change and a major, major turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, you want to use domain-wide labels, all right? So you specify that 
the same label has to be recognized by any node along the path. Now, this is an area that the segment routing people explored in depth, and they discovered that actually it was impossible because all the different platforms have a different range of labels that they allocate from their platform space. That is why they have the complexity of the uh, segment routing global label base. Yeah. So how can we possibly standardize something here that another working group has explored in detail and decided is impossible to do uh, implement on the, the deployed um, equipment base? In fact, it's a, it's a violation of the MPLS architecture because the MPLS architecture um, makes no comment on where the label bases are and whether you should expect the same labels to be um, in any other router. That's why they do swapping, for example. Yeah. Um, the redefinition of the TTL, I believe, is a major architectural change. And the particular definition that you use for it when you set it for zero, I believe, uh, is essentially an undefined operation in MPLS. You see, you're allowed to pipeline operations when you have to deal with multiple labels. And the second um, uh, stage of the pipeline is perfectly entitled to reject the packet at that point. So you cannot a redefine the TTL and that was a cause of major discussion between the ITU and the IETF in a previous um, design of an MPLS OAM. Uh, I have no idea what the consequences of your redefinition of the TC bits would be uh, but I would point out to you that the, um, the ECN people have an interest in this as well. Um, because there's a, an, a congestion notification architecture based on the use of one of these consist, uh, uh, values in the network. But I have no idea what is going to happen. And indeed, if I look at the direction that deterministic networking is going, then they may well wish to classify the TC as part of classifying the packet. Yeah. Um, we've already covered the fact that you need to use a, uh, an ESPL because it seems inappropriate, at least at this stage, to take one of our precious tiny number of labels, which everyone wants, and dedicate it to this until, until whatever this is a proven technology. So I think you're going to have to go on ESPLs. And finally, you've, not, you've made no comment about security and privacy. Indeed, you've dismissed that. And yet, you've got a flow identification label in here, which I know the security uh, area is going to be all over the top of. And you need to uh, explain how you're going to deal with their security and privacy issues. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think the most uh, comments from you is really valuable for us and to uh, 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 to keep uh, the solution um, follow the principle of MPRS. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, we totally agree that. And uh, uh, here I just uh, uh, give uh, uh, some feedback about this labor. And uh, yes, currently the, uh, this maybe we can keep the TTL, no problem. And uh, here the flow ID, I think, uh, if uh, it can uh, labor some uh, flu, no problem. It's uh, uh, within the MPR's uh, uh, architecture. And uh, uh, we have some concerns. We also raised uh, some uh, uh, concerns here. Uh, we Sorry. reused the traffic class to uh, indicate uh, the loss measurement color marking and uh, the delay measurement color marking. Uh, from my point of view, there is no clear definition of the traffic class. And uh, the traffic class can be used by operator to indicate what traffic is there. And uh, we can use the definition by themselves, um, uh, use the, the, the traffic class bit to indicate uh, that is a uh, colorful traffic. So maybe uh, th this uh, solution, th this labor can be within the MPR's uh, architecture. And the problem is this labor. If we change this labor to the extended uh, labor, maybe the whole solution can be under the MPR's uh, architecture. Uh, so so we, are... we will 
we yeah. are running quite late, so um, oh, sorry. So I would sorry. like to. I think there are plenty of comments, so I would like to move the discussion to the mailing list and to address all the comments. Yeah. Yeah. In the okay. Next version. Okay. So, Rakesh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rakesh from Cisco System. So um, this problem has been solved by the IOAM already um, using direct export, right? So no, no, it's, it's different. How is it different? Uh, uh, I'm not sure the child um, could. Okay. Not, okay uh, yeah, I think it's a, maybe okay. we can yeah, have uh, some uh, offline uh, yeah, discussion on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to explain why. I just point Rakesh to my email on the list. So I indicated how uh, alternate marking method is different. Okay, from now we're stealing in time for any other person. So please sit down and we go on. Mine. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Right. Ah. Yeah. How does it work? Okay. So I'm going to talk about the draft on uh, updating the LSP, LSP ping IANA registers. Um, last time I talked about the use and misuse and abuse of uh, some of the registers and we actually sorted that out and getting home we found one new problem that we actually also wanted to include in this draft. and. It has to do with, uh, again, the background we have. We have had a couple of changes over the years, and some of the drafts uh, has been making small changes. In RSC 8166, we tried to actually do what we thought was the intention, and it turned out that we failed there also. Um, so what we're discussing now is mandatory and optional TLVs. With my background, uh, pretty much within uh, LDP, a mandatory LDP is something that needs to be in a message if it's defined to be in the message. An optional TLV is something that uh, can be there or cannot be there, uh, and uh, the message is still well formed. Uh, I have an example here uh, on the uh, hello message from um, on LDP. Uh, the common uh, parameters, hello parameters, are mandatory. They need to be there. The, uh, there are also a lot of optional parameters that you can stick into a hello message if you want to. The, oops, what happened? Uh, so, in RSE 4379 and also a bit in 8029, uh, they used, actually, they never explicitly used the term um, mandatory and optional TLV, uh, but implicitly uh, they had a different meaning. The meaning was that if you get uh, a TLV or a sub TLV, from a range that is defined as half of the space, uh, a lower half of the space, you are required to take an action uh, that's also defined in the document. That is what we talk about as mandatory TLVs or sub TLVs. Optional TLVs in that type of do in that type of document is TLVs that you can just uh, don't care. You can kind of silently drop them. Uh, the problem here is that. Uh, it has been hard for people coming with the different background actually to, to agree on what mandatory and optional means in uh, 43, 79, 80, 29. So, something happens when I... So, what we propose is actually to change the text on uh, the... Um, uh, TLVs and sub-TLVs. Actually, sub-TLVs are not 
discussed at all in any of these doc documents. It's only the TLVs. But sub-TLVs has the same effect. If it's not recognized, you need to send the message back. So uh, we are saying that we are removing the uh, mandatory and optional and just defines what is required for um, TLVs, sub-TLVs from those ranges. And um, I think I think it, th this worked quite well. Uh, the drawback is that if we do this, there are I think three or maybe four documents that also need to be updated. Um, on the other hand, if we don't do it, there are about sixteen or seventeen documents that would need to be updated uh, to actually make the um, make a consistent view of uh, sub -t uh, optional and mandatory TLVs in, uh, in, in the LSP ping registers. So this is the least um, hard way to do it. Uh, and um, our next step is actually to go home, do the updates, um, add text that actually changes the document that we need to change, and then we would be re ready for working group last call. Questions? You are going to do... I thought we were going to have Carlos here, but ah, you are up next. For a moment, I thought that Safar was going to. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Carlos Pignataro from Cisco, and uh, today I have a very, very straightforward um, draft um, and, and a couple of slides detailing what we're doing. This is for uh, segment routing. Uh, actually, hold on, let me see. Actually, Safar, do you want to do this one? Yeah, and I'll do the other one. There was a mistake in the title uh, of the draft. It got switched, so that's why there was confusion. Uh, in the agenda, there was a switch of the title. So anyway, OK. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, draft on generic fact tailways for LSP ping. This is for a segment routing. On behalf of my co-authors, uh, OK. So problem statement. The issue that we have today for the uh, MPLS ONM is that every time a new fact is defined, we have to go and define ONM fact for uh, every time a new segment or SID type is defined, we have to go and define a fact stack sub TLV for ONM purposes. What happens because of this is that, um, and, and we have incidences here that some fact type for a segment routing are already defined, but the ONM fact definition does not exist and working group just start to look into this. And this thing can happen in future as well. And the issue is not only this, the issue not only about defining an ONM fact, but the issue is also that whenever a new ONM fact is defined, it requires a software upgrade to the network. And it does not stop there. We also have scalability issue in terms of the parameter, the sheer number of parameter we need to fill in these uh, segment out effects. So just to give you a preview of this, and, and this is not to pick up on one particular example, uh, but Let's say we, we take a look at even existing fact for 
apparel um, or agency said, it has many parameters that Ingress needs to specify. What is the responder node ID? What is the responder interface ID? What is this uh, neighbor node ID, neighbor interface ID? And because Ingress cannot know in some cases like parallel agencies where or which interface the packet will land to, then we do not have actually a validation procedure properly defined in existing um, RFC. And as we try to define and, and, and continue um, uh, to cover new set types uh, for segment routing, we see this, some of these definitions that are uh, in individual drafts. And, and a lot of this thing is coming really from the fact that the ONM for NPLS were defined with control plane and data plane validation together. So the information was there so that the nodes can validate data plane and against the control plane consistency. And that is the root cause of uh, what we are seeing here. And today we do not have a procedure that if you want to simplify this, we can just validate the data plane itself and skip the control plane validation. Um, the closest to that that comes uh, is uh, uh, NILFAC, uh, but, but we don't have, the NILFAC does not have enough validation built in it. So motivation here is that uh, we try to simplify and uh, the fact definition define one fact definition that works for all segment routing set type uh, set types and it actually is simple so once we deploy we don't have to up update that and and second part is that it um, it also simplify the initiator job in terms of filling the data that is required for validation and control plane and data plane validation is a node behavior, node local behavior, and it should be done in a node local fashion. Um, so that's the motivation. So for solution is really going back to, if you try to look at it from that point of view, is we really have to look into the MPLS data plane, uh, data model, and, and I'll explain it using a, an example here. So from a procedure point of view, um, one way to look at it is that when we have an LSP or when we're pinging, we have an endpoint in mind. So in this case, we're looking at node 8 as the destination node, and node 1 is the initiator. So node 8 can develop against all the labels that it has. It's local labels. Uh, let's say it's local agency set. Uh, it's, it's local uh, prefix sets, whether they belong to the main algo or to the flex algo, so let's say 16,008, uh, 160008 is, is local prefixed. So basically just bound this to that I can, for and for this SID or for this label, I can receive packet on any interface uh, and 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 I can validate that, that data plane uh, action for a send for this label, top label was correct. Uh, similarly, for the uh, SID 161288, which is uh, for the flex cell go 128, uh, it can receive it on an interface. But on the agency SID, which is uh, which is set up by Node 7, you can have multiple cases. One case is that agency SID 9178, which is bound to link 1. So the Node 8 creates is local information that uh, for this, uh, label type for this agency said I should be receiving this uh, packet on this link one and I should be the endpoint. And for uh, 979278, which is the link on the south, uh, it, it binds uh, that information that for any packet receiving with this label and endpoint being me, um, it has to be linked to. And for a parallel agency, it would determine that I can receive either on link one or link two. Uh, but this is done based on local decision. When an initiator 
initiates um, the thing, it puts in the fact the label, the target label, and the endpoint, the expected endpoint. And it, it will work also for binding set. You can see how it will work for binding set very easily and how it will work for other set type. And with that top label, or let's say if the, if the packet is sent with top label 160008, it will land at node number eight. Don't know what eight will say, am I the endpoint? Yes. Is this my local set? Yes. So that's a positive response. If the packet lands on some other node, then the endpoint would not match and it may not be the local label for that, that node and the validation will fail. Similarly, if the target is a agency set, the endpoint is node eight. Node eight is able to validate whether it receives the packet on the right interface or not, whether this is being parallel agency or this is being uh, the agency that is bound to one particular interface. So I have a question regarding yes. this this particular example. Uh, Chris Bauer is with Juniper. Yes. Uh, so if you add a link from six to eight. Yes. Okay. And that also has the label ninety two seventy eight. Yes. How how does eight properly validate that that again the against the link let's call that link link three okay it would have a local information at eight it will be bound to that link three so a valid um, a ping valid response should be received on interface link three not shown here right, it will it, it receive supposed, if it receive on link supposed two to come in on the link between seven and eight and instead it comes in on the link between six and eight you can't tell the difference between that with this scheme. If if you have uh, the link, if it if it's the endpoint, uh, yes. So and this is sort of a, a least common denominator approach to validating the forwarding plane. So it it kind of works in most situations, but doesn't work in some situations. In some situation, when you have uh, same label advertised by the neighbor um, and you have a clash, label clash for agency seed only, not for prefix seed, uh, you can have that condition, but those those okay. things should be rare. So, I mean, it seems like, you know, a lot of work, a lot of the work goes into actually getting the forwarding plane validation correct. And this is sort of simplifying the control plane validation, but that's actually not the hard part to do. So it seems like if we're going through the trouble of doing this, we should do it as robustly as possible and not sort of a, a least common denominator approach. No, that's I my, mean my take on this okay. is sort so, of least common denominator. So there are there are there are there's the two approaches here. One approach is the label based approach, which is this. There's another approach, is, which is the interface-based approach, where you can bound a specific, uh, a specific interface on which you should be receiving, or a set of interfaces. Okay, but you're not concerned with like which IGP who advertised this is was OSP, FIS, IS. Uh, you're not concerned with those parts. You're concerned with this is the behavior from one one in generating a ping you should be receiving on this interface is my forwarding plane is working correctly okay and 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 i'm not saying okay so the point here is there we can still define a fact type that works in the cases that you mentioned which is basically rather than having the owners on node number eight to do this uh, uh, this uh, uh, generation of this table that it can use to verify if I receive this uh, this packet correctly, which, which also means rather than having the agency sit in the FAC, you can have the label, the interface information of it as the endpoint on which it should receive against that label stack. So, so I mean, it seems though that defining two approaches is sort of the, the worst of both possible worlds. I mean, no, a, no. a robust approach and then a least common denominator approach then sort of results in just interop problems and more more testing um, I also disagree with your your initial statement 
that this is sort of a, a process that, that we're, we're changing, we're, we're proposing a protocol that's sort of robust to IETF process. That is, uh, you mentioned people aren't defining OAM effects when they're defining the original uh, segments. I mean, that seems like, you know, if we had better discipline, we could simply uh, solve that problem. So it, it's not only the problem is that you're not defining the fact. The problem is uh, is also to get those parameter fill in by an ingress node. Ability for an ingress road to grab all those parameter to be able to send in this message is an, is is not possible in all ways. And a lot of time you actually have to go and then there is another draft uh, on the agenda. Once it comes, you will see that. You actually have to go and get that information from the control plane because it's not for a human to be entering all those information or parameter is not possible. <clears throat> so, so you get it from the control plane. Uh, so we are running late, very late. So um, just I cut the queue after Tarek and then we should move the discussion to the mailing list. Okay. Uh, Tarek with Juniper. Uh, Zafar, I did send comments about this draft uh, on the mailing list. I encourage you to respond. I will raise one comment here uh, from the set. There are cases where the label a collision can happen on eight. You have multiple SRFX trying to claim the same label. Uh, and there are actually, they're stated in one of the uh, spring working group documents how you handle such collisions. And you, you have a tie-breaking criteria. Now, for the egress to do validation, the, the label is valid. And it will pick one of the facts and bind it to that label. Uh, but the ingress may think it's validating something different, a different fact. So unless the ingress fills the SR fact that it's trying to validate, it doesn't know what it's trying to validate. It will say, yeah, it's a valid label, but it might not be the correct valid label that the ingress wants to validate. So it's missing. There are holes there, I see. Yeah, so I think what could be, and, and this is, uh, the work that we could do as, to address this comment is to actually have the interface information on which you, the package should be received rather than the label. That's more direct uh, and, and, and complete. I have one comment. Can I? If it's a short one. talked about uh, the ingresses getting all the parameters. I think it's very simple. Just do BGPLS. You get the whole topology and then you know what each label means. Yeah, but you can you take the information from the control plane and then validate that information uh, uh, on on the node. So you take the information. The, the whole point of doing control plane versus data plane validation procedure get get lost because you get the information from this control plane. Okay. Now it's Carlos, and I think I'm correct this time. Yeah, OSPF that one. Yeah, OSPF that one. That's really what I was going for. Don't worry. All right, second try. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is indeed a very, very straightforward draft. And a couple of slides, probably more than a couple, actually, um, you know, just to give a lot of contextual details um, on this. But, um, you know, essentially, if I have to summarize what this is about, it's really about asking for a code point for OSPF v3 for a couple of information elements within LSP ping. And that's because when we set those up, we set them up for OSPF generically. And now we're finding that we actually need to differentiate between OSPF v2 and v3. So do you want to start with the question, Loa? I will wait. Thank you. Um, 
problem statement uh, is this is a rephrasing of, of what I said. The main intention is that we created a couple of sub registries in the LSP ping parameters, which actually use a protocol field. And this protocol field is really used for doing control plane validation and verification of the data plane. The protocol field exists in the downstream detail mapping, TLV, and it also exists in um, the seeds for uh, the target fix for, um, there are three of them, target fix tags for uh, segment ID fix. You can see right there graphically um, the three seed sub TLVs where we define the protocol field and how we actually set it up historically for OSPF only. Um, ISIS is agnostic to layer three, OSPF v2. Uh, runs over IPv4 and advertises IPv4 prefixes and reachability. OSPFv3 runs over IPv6 but advertises both address families. And the other place where we have the protocol field defined for OSPF only um, is within uh, the label stack sub TLB in the DD map. This is a request that this draft is making, um, OSPF v3 in those uh, two specific registries. And, you know, even though this is a fairly straightforward draft in which we actually explain some of the context for when we actually realized that we needed this, um, even though it's really straightforward, we really invite and welcome uh, review in-depth review, comments, questions, observations, constructive criticism. And, you know, given though that is a fairly straightforward draft also, we all actually request adoption on this very first presentation. So thank you. Okay, so Loa Anderson. Uh, Carlos, there is, so I think this is a very neat little draft. It does what it tells, tells us that they want to do. Uh, pretty clear, easy to read. I have, but one problem. So today there is a code point for OSPF in the registers. Are you going to use that code point for OSPF v2 in the future? If that is the case, uh, you should rename it. Correct. And that's that's a great question, Loa. So you know our experience says that that code point is not used in deployment today. Um, are you saying it's not used at all? So our yes. Yeah, so what we understand is that is not using deployment today. And if that's the case, you know, the easiest thing to do is to actually rename that to SPF v2. At the same time, the safer thing to do is to obsolete it and get a new one for v2. And we're really open to doing either of those. Uh, I would take the safe way out and actually obsolete the current code point and uh, add two new code points, one for OSPF v2 and one for v3. Uh, I'm not, I, I thought we had deployments of this. If we have had deployments, I would be very strict on doing it that way. But if you don't have any deployments, actually, actually I, should, I should take that back because I was thinking of just to be, you know, very specific and clear. I was thinking of this use of the protocol field. Uh, however, um, this one is co absolutely deployed, yeah. running and deployed everywhere throughout. So, okay. so um, then I think we should deprecate and instantiate two new code points. Thank you, uh, Tarek with uh, Juniper. Um, Carlos, I have a maybe it's a silly question, but uh, just clarification from you. Uh, OSPF v3 is specific to IPv6. Can we not rely on the AFI uh, on in, in the message, 16 bytes, to know this is OSPF v3? And it might be mis uh, silly. Uh, no, no, no such a thing at all. Um, <laughs> you know, and if anything, there's only silly answers. So hopefully I'll, <laughs> I'll give you one that is not too silly. 
uh, the address family yeah. is going to tell the reachability uh, information address family, right? Sure. Not right. the protocol that is advertising it. Right. And in that case, if you get IP, if you get IPv4, that can be OSPV2 or V3. So that's why you cannot disambiguate. Okay, so, so what you're saying is version three can carry both uh, address families. Okay. Although Correct. Um, okay. And I think uh, we wrote that down, but maybe we did. Oh yeah. On. Do you mind scrolling? A yeah. Thank you. So yeah, you can see that there. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Hi again. Uh, it's Tarek, and I'm giving you an update on the Yang data models that we're driving in MPLS Working Group. Um, this is a quick update. I'll go over the draft current status and the next steps that we're projecting. Uh, we have the first one is the MPLS Yang draft. Um, this draft has undergone a Yang doctor review recently, um, and uh, we've addressed all of the comments that came uh, back from the review. We have no outstanding issues on this. So the next steps are going, going ahead and requesting working group uh, last call. Um, no open issues. Uh, we encourage the working group to give us feedback if, if they get to review it again. Uh, the second one is the uh, MPLS static king for static LSPs. Uh, this again undergone a, a Yang doctor review and uh, the authors did address all of the comments. There are no outstanding issues. And we're going to go ahead uh, with the working group last call uh, um, as a next step. Uh, now, next, we have this MPLS LDP Yang draft. This draft, uh, we uh, version 7 of it, it's currently in, on version 7. And uh, we did go ahead, um, it completed its, its working group last call, and we did submit it to IESG. Uh, but part of that process, because of the first Yang doctor review, um, happened in 20, back in 2017 uh, on an older revision. We were asked to review it again, and uh, that happened. And there were comments that came back of the, from the last review that happened. Um, so the authors, my understanding, are looking into the comments and they will uh, they will look to address them. Um, there are also more comments that came from Tom Patch uh, about the draft. So we we do encourage you the authors to look into them. Um, as I mentioned, the, the the currently the draft is in IESG. So we want as next steps we want to address the comments and give a go ahead so that the AD. Um, it does the proper uh, next steps. Uh, Kamran, you want to comment on this? Yeah, uh, so as, as we discussed offline, yes, uh, we'll be working on this and addressing all the comments from the young doctors and any pending comments from um, RD Review. And we'll be submitting a draft uh, post ITF. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so the next uh, draft is actually a sister draft of uh, the first one. Um, uh, it's not. Uh, the, it's not in the. It's not submitted to IESG yet, uh, but we understand it's close to being complete. Um, but just like the first one, the, the one I did mention on the previous slide, it has undergone a Yang Doctor review um, in tw in, back in 2017. So most likely we will go through another round of review, and they will trigger comments. So we 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 do encourage the authors to proactively respond so that we can uh, progress faster on this one. Uh, next, we have a draft for LSP Ping Yang, and it has a config next to it. Although uh, we were discussing, uh, it it covers state and config, so the the config there is questionable. Um, the current status it's at the revision six at the moment, and um, 
we did complete a working group adoption poll. Um, there were several comments that came back uh, as part of that pro process. Um, there was no traction from the authors to address those comments. Um, currently, the, the draft is in expired state. Um, as next steps, we, we, do, we want to hear from the authors um, if there is still interest in driving this uh, draft forward. Uh, we want to refresh the ID if so, and uh, we move ahead with adopting uh, the document. If any one of the authors uh, is present and wants to comment, uh, feel free. Okay, and that, that was it. Uh, these are the Yang models that we're driving in, the, in this working group. And um, you know, let us know if you have any questions. Good evening. Uh, I'm Shraddha Agde, talking on behalf of uh, my co-authors about uh, EPOAM FEC definition. So there's nothing new here. It's uh, you know traditional MPLS OAM. There are new labels, and we are defining facts for those uh, new labels. So that's the background. We have presented it multiple times, and I wouldn't spend more time here and just spend a little bit time on the updates uh, in this revision. So we did a few editorial changes and uh, TLB structure optimization uh, for considering IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So we, we jump on to peer node SID because peer adjacency SID, uh, it's the same and there is no change from last revision. So peer node SID has changed a little bit from last revision. So we had a, um, a address family there. Instead, uh, we thought that it's better to have number of IPv4 interface pairs and number of IPv6 interface pairs. This is because um, uh, the there can be two interfaces on which the peer node side wants to load balance the traffic on. One is IPv4 and has IPv4 address, and another has IPv6 address, and we should be able to accommodate that. And when so 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 the uh, TLB structure has been updated, and when there are both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, the IPv4s will be uh, IPv6 will be followed after the IPv4 address pairs. So that's the update uh, in this revision. Similarly, peer sets it, the same update. So instead of having an address family, we have number of IPv4 interface pairs and number of IPv6 uh, interface pairs uh, in the TLB definition. So we request for review and comments, uh, and we also ask for uh, working group uh, adoption uh, it's been presented multiple times. Um, this is the third time we're presenting it. Uh, and, and we believe that this should have been done when uh, the EPE sits were defined. So, so as to just avoid, uh, you know, having situation when EPE is deployed and we don't have OAM for those. Um, so I think this is the really the work needed to be done quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, Zafar Ali. So I have the same comment. Can you go back to one slide? See, the thing is, is that this is getting much more complex. We need to get simplification. This information, the amount of information that's going is burden on egress, burden on egress. You try to get information to validate uh, essentially the forwarding behavior. So what we will be willing to work with, again, the document that I presented, uh, and we spoke offline is to work with to find an easier ground. This is uh, we started this route as well, and then we realized that this is uh, this is uh, way too complex. And then, how long we're we going to chase uh, a, a sit type after sit type to define a new fact type? And we're going to be in this situation forever. So, 
I what I would say that uh, we'd be willing to work with uh, the authors of this draft to try to find a simplified ground, and 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 we believe it can be achieved. It can be achieved by uh, using either the uh, the seed allocator ID, um, uh, or it could be achieved by the interface addresses on which the packet should be received. It should be done so that it is not bound to the egress PE, it's not bound to the BGP, it, it can be used for parallel agencies of any type, whether the IGP, EPE, some other type, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, so if you want a robust OAM mechanism that people are used to for so many years with the MPLS, I think you have to leave with coming up, uh, you know, preparing this um, this kind of effect and then validating them on the egress. If you want a very generic mechanism, I think it's not going to be that robust. It may not. It might falsely defect. It might falsely detect something, and sometimes it may not even detect. I think that was discussed in the last presentation. Like in in which cases it it can break. Um, no, if you, I come back. If last presentation, if you use the assigner ID, then it solves the problem. The comment that uh, was there. Yeah, it, it, actually, if you can, add the assigner ID, this problem is solved, and it's solved for all set. So, um, here, what uh, do we I gain have by doing about uh, what the assigner ID is? Maybe that if the draft is updated, probably we can read and understand. yeah, draft is updated. Sure. And 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 but but the point is not the point is this that we local information, remote information, um, local AS number, remote AS number, and and, and everybody in the set. I think what we should look for is some simplification that can be applied across the board, not for the APE only, but for the IGP. We can simplify there as well. And and uh, we'd be completely willing to work on that uh, front, but. Sure. So I have a question sort of, uh, I guess Safar uh, commented on like, Simplifying even the IGP versions, which are already defined in what is it, 82, 87? I mean, those are, you know, implemented, interoperability tested, deployed. I, I mean, I would strongly object to anything that says we're going to define a second version of those. For to what purpose? I, I see no no reason to do that for the IGPs. I agree. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Even if you don't do that, this information is way too much and could be simplified. And we can, I mean, we try to do go that route and we can simplify. And I think we should discuss that a bit more. Yeah, sure. uh, I don't think in the current form, uh, it is, it is the, the information is going to be too much difficult for both ingress and egress. Yeah, sure. We can discuss it's over engineered. Yeah. So this draft is about uh, inter-AS OAM for SR networks. Uh, we presented it last time uh, in Montreal. And we uh, we presenting updates to this draft uh, uh, in, in, the, in the new version. So we have new co-authors, Nagendra, Zafar, and Carlos. Uh, so we go back to updates from last revision. So. We received a comment that, uh, so we had labels in the reverse path uh, TLV. And so we received a comment that they, they should be segments instead of labels. So we took that comment and updated this. Uh, so, the, so there is a reverse path uh, sub TLV, which reverse path uh, TLV, which is under MPLS OAM IANA registry. And then there is segment sub TLV. So each seg segment sub TLV uh, looks very similar to what is defined in SR policy list sub TLV. 
and uh, it could have either labels or it could have uh, ipv4 address and optional sid and I ipv6 sid and op or optional um, sid so right now um, this draft is referring to the ayana registry of sr policy list sub tier v because this 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 um, ayana code points is a sub tlv so right now we're uh, directly referring to it i wasn't too sure if this is the that is the right way or uh, we should define a new registry for this and looking for inputs from the working group so this this looks the segment sub tlvs look exactly same as what is defined in sr policy uh, sub tlvs so we have three types we have taken type 1 Uh, which is a label mpls label type 3 which is ipv4 node address and a uh, optional sid and type 4 um ipv6 address and a uh, optional sid so we have covered sr mpls sr mpls for v6 and um, sr v6 has been moved out of scope uh, of this document uh, and as per discussion from last uh, a meeting we will be moving it to mpls working group and renaming the draft so we also have another new section added so this is for dynamically building the reverse path so in in this example r1 may not have the capability to figure out what the reverse path is for when it's pinging from r1 to r4 so we have a mechanism how this can be done and um, the reverse path dynamically built Uh, as the mpls trace route mechanism progresses so this this is applicable for only trace route procedure so when when asbr3 receives a trace route mpls trace route packet it finds out that this packet is received on an inter as link and so it knows that it has to build the reverse path and the way it builds it is it, it takes its own node sid and uh, epe sid in the reverse direction that is asbr3 to asbr1 and then update uh, puts this um, um, this information in the reverse path segment tlv in the ddmt and uh, and so ingress uses it for the next uh, so the next trace route when when the packet has to visit r3 uh. <laughs> so this is a simple solution for inter as soam and uh, We request MPLS working group to accept it as a working group uh, document. Just comments. Yes, Greg, go ahead. I, I have a kind of admin question. Uh, if you look at the two drafts, uh, the EP and the Intrayas, which one do you think is closest to working group last call? Last call? It's uh, not even adoption. Oh, sorry, working group adoption. Yeah, I'm coming. EPE is, I believe, very straightforward. Talk to the mic. So, so EPE, I believe, is very straightforward, and uh, I would expect that they, this this draft is also kind of quite stable in the sense, uh, functionally, there has not been much big change, and probably we should accept both as working group documents. Okay, uh, Greg Mirsky, ZT. Um, so you um, introduce what can be uh, characterized as a three different uh, families of uh, SIDs: MPLS, IPv4, IPv6. So, do you envision that uh, in the return path, uh, more than one family will be used? there is so the, so uh, more than one family in the sense one ipv4 and one ipv6 yes or mpls and v6 yeah so i need to think more about more about that why if somebody would do that but i definitely think that you know the ipv4 address and uh, the sid is a very valid use case because if the srgbs are different just sending the labels doesn't work yeah because again um if that's the case i i think that uh there are uh, some illustration when it will be uh, will be helpful yeah, definitely. otherwise what seems that introduction of sub tovs uh creates an overhead without good reason sure i will add the explanation to that okay draft. thank you thank you
Uh, hi, I'm Anush, and uh, this draft basically talks about an interop issue we saw in a uh, recent customer site. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is the topology. Uh, that was used and here all the nodes are LDP and uh, IGP and LDP enabled. Uh, let's uh, <coughs> consider the following LDP LSPs to prefix E at node B. Uh, so at node B we have a primary LSP uh, PRE which takes the BAE uh, path that is IGP primary path and the backup LSP follows the BCDAE path. The next two slides uh, describe the sequence of events that we uh, saw in this particular uh, topology. So at time T0, the link between node A and node B was brought down. At T1, uh, node B receives LDP shutdown notification from PRA. Uh, the shutdown notification can make it through over the TCP session as long as some reachability exists from A to B. At time T2, uh, node B turns down the LDP LSPs to prefix E, uh, both the primary LSP uh, PRE and the backup which is tied to this primary. As a result of this, any L2 VPN, L3 VPN uh, services on node B which use LDP LSP to E, they see complete traffic loss till uh, the LSP reconverges. That is at time T4. At uh, T3, uh, B receives the link down event for BA physical link. Uh, and by B here, I mean LDP on B. At T4, LDP LSP. Maybe, maybe I could try to, I want to clarify something on, yeah. is this um, like remote LFA? So is there a targeted LDP session involved here that needs uh, no. to occur or, or not? No, the session between A and B is a direct uh, link LDP session. Right, right, but for the, Back, the backup path. Yeah, the backup was, uh, there is RLFA. Okay, uh, but is that one of the sessions you're worried about going down, or is no, it just no. the primary neighbor session? We, uh, we are worried but, only about the primary neighborship here. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that okay. that was the targeted LDP wasn't involved. No. Okay. Uh, at T4, LDP, LSP, uh, PRE reconverges over the BCDAE path and uh, traffic resumes. Can I have a question now on uh, just yes, to sure. better understand? Uh, so A detects uh, the link going down. So A is sending an LSP taking into account its ISIS or OSPF and this LSP is flooded to B. B is reconverging. No, it's LDP. Yeah, but at the same time, if the link is going down, there is also an IGP message sent by A. Yeah. L it could. It, it could, but when you say B receives, when you say T3 B receives link down event, is it uh, its local detection or the detection through reception of the LSP from A? Uh, 
no no it's a local uh, detection and yeah maybe... but before it, it may have received the lsp from a uh it depends it depends <laughs> but that's also a possibility you don't have to wait for b to detect locally the link if a if it if b receives the lsp from a it can also reconverge because you don't have any more v2a connectivity okay uh just to clarify here when i talk about b i actually mean ldp at b uh so these are uh, so the events from t1 to t4 are basically what is seen by ldp okay and when you say um b remove the lsp uh do you assume that b is running ordered control of ldp or independent control uh b runs okay b turns down the ldp as a result D of does it remove the ilm or just the uh, the rewrite structure it removes uh, all the LSPs uh, which traverse. Yeah, but a. when you say VLSP, is it just the rewrite structure or is it really the ILM? So the both, both the LSPs as well as ILM. yeah. But if so, you are assuming that it's running ordered control LDP. Yeah, it is ordered control. Okay. You want to ask? If there is any question, you can. Okay. Uh, so these are the possible solutions or clarifications that is uh, being suggested. Uh, so one is to relax the requirement of immediately flushing labels when we receive a shutdown notification. Uh, shutdown notification is basically a fatal error. Uh, and the other possible thing is, yeah, LDP needn't reset session to neighbor immediately on receiving, uh, on detecting a link down event. That is when physical connectivity to peer goes down. It may be reasonable to wait for LDP hello address and see to timeout. Uh, you can ask. I, think this. Can, um, I have a question, a uh, comment actually. Comment is a Cisco system. So I look at your draft, uh, you haven't mentioned it here, but I think the draft talks about these, all this um, problem statement in the context of GR, RFC 3478. Is this correct uh, assumption, uh, understanding? Yes, so what we basically uh, are trying to say because is... Because if, if, if LDP gets a shut and and the yeah. bottom line was that it gets a shutdown message and yes. you remove the label bindings. Yes. And because of that, you know, uh, uh, and you wanted to basically avoid shutdown message. So from your draft, at least uh, reading what I got, that you wanted to avoid a yeah, relaxed uh, sending of the shutdown message. And that's why your draft is uh, also recommending a rate of 5036. So one comment I will have it, if this is G in, within the context of a GR, mm -hmm. I think it should be the GR procedure that should be upgrade, up, updated rather than LDP-based procedures from 5036. Second comment I will have it, rather than, rather than uh, you know, blocking sending of the shutdown message, if you look at, look at LDP-RFC 5036, mm -hmm. when you send a sh shutdown message, you can also send an extended status TLV. Yes. That code point, that can give extra information to the receiver. So you can always basically send an extended status to let the receiver know that, you know, you, uh, you know, shutting down, but there's a GR case, you know, you, you may want to do whatever you want to do. So instead of shutting, uh, you know, blocking shutdown message, you should extend the shutdown message and use some extended TLV. Yeah, These actually are two comments the I have. slides uh, have been updated, but I am yet to update the draft after discussions. So uh, for oh, now, oh, we are oh. not recommending blocking of shutdown, but uh, I'm open to suggestions. So whatever you suggested okay, is... Okay, then the draft I read is... Yeah, a bit different, a, totally different than the GR and all this. That's what you have there. Uh, no, GR is still involved, but yeah, I, I agree with your comments. And but if it's a GR specific, I think it should be the GR procedure that should be upgraded, not the LDP based procedures. Okay, I, I will consider it. So we cut the queue after Tarek. So Tarek with Juniper. Um, we had conversation over the mailing list yes. and. Um, I think one of the, your one of the possible solutions you're presenting is uh, wait until the hello uh, is timed out on the adjacency and then react and flush the labels remote labels that you know B will get from A. So if you go back to your drawing, uh, you delay flushing the labels on B 
uh, until the hello uh, times out. The hello times out. Uh, Is that correct? Is that one of the no, uh, possible solutions you have? Okay. Let's say hello times out and right. you tear down the session, but you haven't received any shutdown message yet. So you won't flush the label mappings if GR is enabled. So you, you you are concerned about two cases. One is reacting on link down, and one another one is that reacting on a shut message. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So if you delay the action until the hello times out for both, yes. your solution you're okay with that, right? Yes, if it is, uh, but I don't think RFC like that's what how, okay. That's what I'm gonna say next is, yeah. I thought RFC 5036 does mention uh, that, so we might want to reread that text and and see if they're recommending waiting for the hellos to time out before taking action. Okay, so uh, this was actually seen in a customer site, and our reading was while it suggests. Uh, that it's a criteria of bringing down session. It keeps options open to the implementation. Uh, but yeah, we can discuss more if. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next steps are we, are we welcome reviews, questions, suggestions, and uh, possibly working group adoption after discussion. Okay, thanks. So that was the last presentation and we close MPLS for this ITF meeting. See you all in Vancouver.